Today's topic is Pakistan's economy. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be with you once again. And I'm really happy that I have with me Farooq Iqbal, an economist. He worked for the World Bank for many years, then went to work in Pakistan, and is now back in the US. He's a deep thinker. Let's hear from him what he thinks about Pakistan's economy. Um, hello, everyone. Farooq Iqbal here. Thank you, Subod. Um, I, the, the, uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Subod described the topic as Pakistan's economy. I would add one more element to that, which is Pakistan's perennial economic crisis. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and by that, what I'm referring to is the fact that if you look at the last 15, 20 years, Pakistan has had repeated macroeconomic crises. Uh, there were crises in 2008, then another one in 2013, followed by one in 2018. And now, as we speak today, uh, Pakistan is once again engulfed in a macro and debt crisis. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And my main argument, I'm trying, I will try to explain why that crisis occurs repeatedly. And my main argument is that the periodic crises are due to the operation of a political business cycle in the country in which key political actors, mainly the political party in power, key political actors pursue goals and policies that are inconsistent with macro stability and debt sustainability. I'm not talking about anything else, any other issues of uh, uh, cultural or social or political interest, simply the fact that economic policy is subject to a political cycle and that almost guarantees repeated uh, crises, okay? Hey, I get it, Farooq. What you're saying is, you are a hardcore economist. I'm a hardcore economist. Let's talk economics, okay? Yes. If you get the wrong policies, if you do the wrong policies, you're yes. going to suffer. And that's what, exactly. it's the wrong policies and why they occur. That's what we are going to talk. That's about. what we're going to. And okay. why there is no learning, why the system doesn't get out of it. And that's okay. the politics. Part. Wonderful. Okay. So the cycle actually has three stages. Uh, the three stages are rising public spending, rising imports and falling reserves. And I'm now going to just take you through a few of the last uh, two or three cycles so that you understand what I'm, what, what is actually uh, meant by this, right? Typically, um, once the country gets into a cycle, they appeal to the IMF and to bilateral lenders to give them more uh, uh, foreign exchange, to uh, tide things over. And, and of course, when you go into an IMF program, there is a, uh, a sequence of economic actions that you have to take. So the government takes those actions. So in 2008, when they hit a crisis, uh, and by crisis, I mean, this is a very simple definition, when your foreign reserves have dropped to below two months of import cover. Okay. When you do not have more than two months of import cover, that's a crisis because okay. everyone then thinks you're not going to be able to repay your debt and all kinds of funny things begin to happen. We'll, we'll get into that. All right. So the crisis begins, let's say, with an IMF program in place. There was one in 2008. Well, what happens then? Roughly two years before Pakistan has elections every five years, 2008, 13 and 18 were the last three elections. Okay. So Roughly two years, one to two years before uh, an election, the government starts priming the economy, as it were, by overspending, okay. by pushing up spending. This is not a surprise. You, you hear about it all the time. But uh, Pakistan's uh, fiscal position is such that even a 1% of GDP increase in public spending can create problems. And I'll tell you how those problems happen. So... Two years before the election, public spending goes up. It's, it's amazing how consistent this has been in the last 15 years. When mm -hmm. you look at a graph, you know, so, so I said what, uh, uh, let's say we start with 2013. So before the election of 2013, on the dot from 2011, you begin to see a rise in public spending. Okay, So public spending begins to go up. 
it turns out that Pakistan's economy displays a very high degree of import elasticity to consumption, to private and public consumption. So when public spending goes up, imports begin to rise. So the ratio of imports to GDP begins to rise. So, Farooq, let me put it for the ordinary person. Yes. The government begins to spend money beyond yes. what it gets in taxes. Yes. And when the government begins to spend, it leads to major increase in imports. In imports, exactly. Right. Okay. And now, and you again, you can see that in the imports to GDP chart, you'll see from 2011 to 2013, you saw, you saw that upswing in imports. All right. What happens next? Well, unless the imports are offset by rising exports, you begin to, you begin to have a balance of payments uh, or current account deficit problems, right? And that's exactly what begins to happen in the case of Pakistan. As I said, even a small jump in public spending of 1% of GDP beyond agreed parameters leads to this rise in imports. And the rise in imports then begins to be affected uh, uh, begins to reflect itself on foreign reserves. Mm -hmm. Two things happen here in order for that effect to be kind of... Uh, one is that the same government that is pumping up public uh, spending, consumption, says that they are going to hold the line on exchange rate depreciation because they don't want to import inflation. Okay. Okay. So essentially, they defend the rupee. At the same time as they are uh, uh, raising spending, imports are beginning to go up, and the government decides that they should defend the rupee rather than allow the exchange market to adjust uh, imports and exports and uh, at least uh, uh, prevent a current account deficit from enlarging. Well, they don't. They take the step, which is a political step, and the argument is always, otherwise we'll have lots of inflation. The hidden argument is inflation will make them look bad to the electorate and they may lose votes. Okay. All right? That's when you begin to see on the reserve side a decline in reserves. And in a, I, I can give you some numbers, but basically uh, in a normal year, Pakistan carries about four months of import cover. Reserves are roughly about four months, right? That's considered very good for Pakistan. I mean, other countries may feel that that's really dangerous, but for Pakistan, in the last uh, 15 years, it's never gone above four months of import. So four months is like a good thing, okay? But right before the election, as the spending and the imports are rising, reserves begin to fall. And all kinds of macro confusion start precisely at the time of the election, we realize that imports are down to two months or one and a half months, a crisis afoot. Nobody will take any action because there's going to be an election or you're in the middle of the election. In the last few elections, uh, 2008 and then 13 and 18, the government's actually changed. Different political parties came into power, mm -hmm. but they each followed this script, meaning two years before their next election, they started spending. Uh, they started a spending increase. They allowed imports to get out of control. They tried not to devalue or depreciate. And before they know it, around a month or two, or in the middle of the elections, they had a full-blown macroeconomic crisis. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, to me, there's a very simple mechanism that explains why Pakistan goes into repeated crises, and the mechanism has to do with the political business cycle where politicians basically try to play this game of winning or winning an election by engaging in spending mm -hmm. and not observing the uh, guardrails that uh, more uh, that that, that uh, technocrats or let's say the IMF or others would impose on such behavior knowing what the characteristics of the Pakistan economy are so that's it that's a very simple argument okay you can right. see it in operation in the last 15 years. Fine. But uh, just want to add, rather than yes. question, that they don't succeed in convincing the people that this works because people vote them out. Uh, yes. So now here is the thing. So it turns out it is not that they don't succeed in convincing people. There are actually two reasons why 
politicians like to spend a lot. Yeah. The first reason is they think that by spending, they will win an election. Okay. They think, right? They think. But the second is they also know that they are, when they are spending more, the opportunities for personal enrichment, for graft, for corruption <laughs> are better. Right. Okay. Right. So it's a very simple thing. Yeah, I understand. And political party, regardless of how its leaders paint themselves, at the core, the MNA MPA level, there is a great interest in well, how much money does it mean for me to be spending in my area? Yeah. Because that determines my personal wealth. Yeah. As well as my, what I think are my my chances of success. Now, but in the Pakistani case who actually wins in the elections, if we go by the last 15 years, there's a more complicated formula in which a fourth element, not a political party, is also involved. All right. Okay. I understand. <laughs> okay. okay. But okay. I'm just saying that, you know, if, you, you know, people try to spend their way to win votes, but then they lose. So maybe somebody should wake up and say, hey, maybe this won't work. There, there is no learning. This okay, is there's no like learning. A, there is a okay. built-in... Uh, as soon as you're in power, you look for opportunities to make money. Right, I understand. Right, understand. so there's right. no learning. You always think you can you can get away with it. Okay, right. And anyway, so even that, if you don't get means, a, yeah. even if you don't get away with it, you have made enough money in five years. You, you have made some money, let's say. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, yeah. But this, you know, when you see this happening repeatedly, uh, then you basically say, all right, well, this, there has to be a way out of this. If they won't do it themselves, if they will not self-discipline, right. then maybe we ought to put some guardrails that they cannot uh, break. Right. right. And so there is, I mean, if we wanted to think about, well, how do we get out of it? Uh, there would be, uh, instead of what happens in all these cases is at the point of crisis, with or without a change in political uh, party, at the point of crisis, they run to the IMF and try and get a program. And then, of course, they follow the program for a couple of years. The, the, the what should say, the death spiral instinct doesn't kick in until two or three years after, right. or two years before the next election. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this is a problem that the IMF is supposed to set the guardrails on public spending. Right. To, but the even if you sign an agreement with the IMF, after some time, you break it. Yes. So in Pakistan's case, what is interesting is that in the last three cases of uh, EFF, the IMF program, uh, the first one failed. The country simply walked away from the agreement. In the second one, the country observed the agreement. But the agreement, remember, is only for three years. Right. They still had two years to wreak some serious damage, and they did. Yes. After following a very successful IMF program from 2013 to 2016, yeah. the government of that of the day started yeah. pumping up and managed to screw things up in two years. Then yeah. in 2018, a new government takes over. They also do an agreement with the IMF. It takes them a year. In yes. 2019, they do the agreement. And they also observe the agreement for two years, all the way up to 21. Yeah. And then in 21, they start to basically get really uh, angsty about what's going to happen. Yeah. And they deviate from the IMF program. And uh, before they know it, all kinds of bad stuff start. And by the way, just to make, just to kind of drive the point home, at this point, as of today, the IMF program is in abeyance. They, yes. It is not followed. Yes. So yeah. these states, all right. And Pakistan's reserves are roughly uh, $2.8 billion, which is uh, 1.5 months of import. Yeah. Cover. Okay. yeah. All right. So, and the exchange rate is um, has slipped from roughly 150 to 300 rupees per dollar right. over the last uh, 12 months. Yes. And is basically now being managed administratively by refusing letters of credit and so on and so forth. All kinds of weird things happen when you are forced to do this administratively. Yeah, because you don't have the money to spend. You don't have the money. Exactly. You don't have the dollars. And if you yeah. don't sign, I mean, the, you have signed the agreement, but the IMF is not giving you the money because they're saying, look, you aren't following the rules. You're not following the, the exactly. rules. So exactly. you are so. struggling to get 
uh, yes. that money flow. Sure. And yeah. Until you get money from the IMF, you won't get from any Western source. You might get from other places. Other oh, places, but but even other sources, and usually the you know the um, uh, uh, the government does line up resources from a number of bilateral sources and a yes. number of, and 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 the IMF, but many of these sources now also want an IMF program in place because that is in a way their only guarantee that sound economic management will take place yeah and okay. everything will not be a political decision looking at the next election or some personal uh, some personal uh, angle uh, within the government right? okay uh, so uh, uh, i'm sorry but it's as simple as that it's nothing more complicated once we get down to details of course one could say well why is there such a high import el elasticity to private consumption or public consumption and why does uh, why isn't ex why aren't exports rising by enough to compensate and so on and so forth but this basic cycle uh, keeps okay. pushing the country down so no i understand uh, what i mean you know we could spend hours discussing the details right the big picture is what you are giving us that listen uh, the governments tend to overspend Yes. Right? And yes. Uh, economic theory tells us that uh, the foreign account deficit is just a reflection of overspending domestically. Yeah. Right? And yes. we see it exactly. being, we see it there in uh, Pakistan. You're saying you overspend, and that means you overspend dollars too. And yep. you, you, over, you, you overspend, spend you overspend yeah. rupees, it means you overspend dollars. And if you Very overspend quickly. dollars, then you don't have enough dollars and then the world doesn't trust you anymore. Doesn't trust you. Now, yeah. I, I would add a couple of points here okay. as Next, well. Please. Uh, which is that uh, because the country has been doing this for a very long time, 40 years, I would say, um, it just does not have any margin for maneuver. Meaning, as I said, even a 1% uh, deviation from an agreed spending path seems to lead to really grave consequences. Uh, but that's because there's no money in the bank. They've only yeah. got, you know, they've only got four months of reserves in a good year. Right, right. right? Yeah. It would be quite another thing if they had 12 months of reserves or 24 months of reserves or whatever. Let's say 12 months, right? Yeah. Uh, there would be an opportunity. They could get away with for, with, with bad policy for a year or so. But in this case, they can't. And the political parties and politicians have not really learned this lesson that they are running an economy which does not have much room for maneuver. Oh, okay. They really have... Maneuver uh, meaning it doesn't have much room for overspending. Okay. For overspending yeah. uh, and and uh, uh, being too... Being too uh, nationalistic about the exchange rate yeah so you better stick to yes. very no. tight and narrow if no. you want long no. run you have yeah. to be tight and narrow so now here's the second point okay of course this was figured out by many people many years ago and in the in one of the imf programs uh, this was the one done somewhere in the 2000s. Pakistan received a debt restructuring after a default. They received a debt restructuring in 2000 and, uh, 2000 and 2001, right? At around that time, there was a debt restructuring. And one of the things that was uh, a part of that overall deal was that Pakistan would uh, uh, pass a fiscal responsibility and, and debt limitation act, right? right? Right. which I think India also has. Yes, but, it has. Right? Yes, yes. Now, that was passed in 2005. Since 2005, the quantitative target set by that act, I, I forget the exact details, but this is like Maastricht and others. There's a target set for debt to GDP, yeah. and the target set for the fiscal deficit, right? right. Uh, so let's say one is 6% and the other is 60% or something like that. Right. The, the, those two targets have never been met after 2005. In other words, the law was passed and it has been observed in the breach ever right. since. Okay. Now, technically, you could do it because the law has some language, which you know, some loophole which says this will be 
provided there is no national emergency. Right. So they declare a national emergency okay. and they let the fiscal deficit go to six, seven percent and they let the debt rise above. You know, that the debt now is uh, is um, uh, more than 60 percent of GDP. I, I, the exact numbers again are right. But it's, it's just it's one of those things where sensible technocratic guardrails were imposed, not observed. An IMF program is imposed or is, is negotiated. It is followed for a few years, but then the political impulse to get away with something uh, just kicks in. And uh, there you go. Okay. All right. In spite of this, Farooq, how would you say has been the GDP growth rate? Because GDP has increased. How would you assess the GDP growth well, rate? So again, the, the GDP situation or the growth rate situation is, is one where uh, recently, I was taking a look at the last 50 years, so right, like since 1970. Clearly, the period from 1970 to 2000 can be uh, looked at as reasonably good, with GDP growing at between 5 and 6%. Okay. Right? After that, it's been pretty bad, because it's been growing at under 5%. So there has been a break. The long-term growth rate has tended to decline from the highs achieved let's say in the 70s and 80s. And now these days it's more in the neighborhood of uh, three to 4%, right? Yeah. So it's uh, it, it, has, it has not been good, but there are a few other things that uh, indicate that over the long run decay has set in. And uh, one is the total investment to GDP ratio has been declining yeah. and within it, both private sector investment to GDP and public sector investment to GDP has declined. Mm -hmm. So public investment to GDP is almost entirely dependent on foreign fund financing. Wow. It has gone down from a high of as much as 7% of GDP at one point to roughly 3% of GDP now. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So with 3% of GDP, a government cannot provide the expansion of productive capacity that will help growth in the long run, right? Yes. Uh, right. Where are you going to get growth from? Yes. So uh, they think they can get it all from efficiency inducing measures and so on and so forth, but we are not there yet. No. Okay. It has to come from fundamental investments in, in, in power, in water, in uh, research, in uh, roads and so on and so forth. They try to do that, but the some uh, education and health the sum total in, of investment is yes. just uh, uh, three percent of GDP. Okay, all right. Fair enough. Yeah, no. Yeah. Without without that investment, you haven't set the foundation for long term growth. Yes. So yeah. things were good 20, 30 years ago, I would say, but they've been declining, and that's a whole different story. If you want yeah. to say, well, what's the reason for this decline? Yeah. There is, you know, there are external, internal, and external things, but. Uh, that's where we are. My interest more today was really in just saying, why are we getting into these repeated macro crises? No, I understand. And I think you have explained it very well. I mean, in very simple terms, you have irresponsible economic policies. And in the end, you pay the price for those irresponsible economic policies. Yes. I and these are important actors, the political actors, because they run policy. Yeah. not the technocrats, right? No, no. And uh, their interests are inconsistent, as I said, with macro stability and uh, debt sustainability. Uh, and the debt question arises simply because we have no margin for maneuver. Anything we do immediately takes our reserves down to close to zero. And so you have to kind of, you know, look for foreign uh, uh, support right away, right? Okay, so fair enough, uh, Farooq. Thank you so much. It's a, such a clear exposition of uh, poor macroeconomic policies and a good explanation as far as I'm concerned as to why they don't learn and continue to follow those poor macroeconomic policies. Any last words you have? Uh, well, uh, personally, yes, because having looked at this, I think that on the one hand, one can say a country gets the government it deserves, democracy, elections, this and that. But frankly, when you have uh, this sort of irresponsible 
uh, economic policy or economic management, then it's, it strikes me that it would be a good idea for certain domains of policy to be carved out and made the responsibility of uh, technical committees, right? By that I mean, for example, in the United States, monetary policy uh, is the domain of the Federal Reserve. Right. Right? And it's sort of, you know, whether interest rates are going to be um, taken up or down doesn't depend on Congress, but it depends on what happens in the Federal Reserve, right? Right. So to me, for example, an independent uh, Federal Reserve or State Bank or Reserve Bank of India, whatever, an independent monetary authority is a good idea. But we have also seen, at least in the case of Pakistan, that a significant domain of fiscal policy should also be, I, I think should be. Now, that domain, they first tried to do it through the Fiscal Responsibility and Debt Management Act, right? That has not worked. So my suggestion would be that law should be dusted off and the loopholes should be fixed and those guardrails should now be kind of, uh, you know, cemented somehow so they can't be uh, easily broken out of. Okay. So to me, that's important that uh, given the performance we uh, of the political uh, business, uh, given how the political business cycle has worked, I think going forward, we should have uh, significant domains of fiscal and monetary policy uh, sort of pre-restricted, if you will. Okay. All right. right. Fair yeah. enough. Thank you so much. I get the point that we must find a way to keep the government from overspending. And that has to be coming from economic guardrails because that's what it is. Okay. Right. Thank and, you so and provided much. those guardrails are selected democratically, but they should. The people should be, you know, uh, I don't know. They should have like, uh, they should commit in some credible fashion yeah, to okay. these uh, policies. So great. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Farooq. Uh, uh, let's say bye to our viewers. Bye, everybody. I'll be back with another uh, distinguished person next time. Bye for now.